tonight. Hallelujah. So I want you to turn with me to two places in Scripture, one in the Old Testament and one in the New. And I'm going to get right down where you live tonight because this message is going to apply to every person in this room. I promise you there is not one single person in this room that this message is, isn't designed for. It is designed for you tonight. I'm going to read a story to you from the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And then we're going to the book of First Peter. And we're going to look at, uh, at uh, how this thing works out in our lives. The title of my message tonight is Facts About Furnaces. Facts About Furnaces. You might say, well, you said this was going to apply to everybody. I'm not in a furnace tonight. Well, hang around and you will be. Because there's something about life that uh, furnaces become a reality. And so if you don't need this message tonight, go ahead and take notes and, uh, and, and put it down in your, in your heart. Uh, because if you don't need it tonight, you'll need it sooner or later, okay? Now in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, is the story of the three Hebrew children uh, as they, they refused to bow down and worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had raised up. And uh, let's beginning, uh, be, begin reading with chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll read uh, six verses, and then we'll skip, and I'll tell you where we're going. Chapter 3 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province, provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So all of these people came. And uh, uh, we'll go down in chapter, uh, verse 3 there. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud to you, uh, to you, cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And then I want you to skip to verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Now I want you to uh, skip down to verse 13. And uh, these Jews had refused to bow down and worship this image. Verse 13, we pick it up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in sympathy, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. You see, there was no court of appeal. It was an immediate thing here that was going to happen if they refused. And then Nebuchadnezzar concludes verse 15 with this question. And who is the God, little g, who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, capital G, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, little g, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, there aren't many sermons that are preached about sermon, uh, about furnace experiences. And uh, the reason uh, that they aren't preached is because fur furnaces and suffering are negative and above everything, people today want positive preaching. 
The faith preachers and positive uh, confession teachers would have you believe that if your faith is strong enough, then your problems will dissolve and disappear. And if your confession is positive enough, the problem also will dissipate. But I, I, I want to tell you, I believe in faith very strongly. And I also believe that we ought to think and speak positively. But I also know this, that no matter how strong your faith is, and no, ma and no matter how positively you speak, there are furnaces in this life. There are experiences when we have to stand up for God, and when we stand up for God, we're going to be persecuted, and we're going to be cast into some type of of a furnace. It may not be this kind of furnace, but it will be some type of persecution or some type of misunderstanding because the devil is not going to let anything like that pass without challenging us and we're going to find ourselves in some uncomfortable situations. Face the facts. You know that too. And so do our brothers that teach uh, the hyperfaith and positive confession doctrine. They go through trials and tribulations just like you and I do. So the question then becomes, how do you deal with the furnace experience? How do you deal with a furnace experience? When you're going through extreme trial and when things are, uh, are at a place where you see no end in sight or no hope, what are you going to do? How should you respond? What are some facts about that that might help you in that particular moment of trial? Well, I'm going to share about four facts about furnaces with you tonight. And uh, the first one is very obvious, and that is that furnaces are a fact of life. How many of you would agree that furnaces are a fact of life? Trials and tribulations are a fact of life. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, you either are dead or you're lying. Because I'm going to tell you, friend, you hang around this life and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to run into some difficulties if you hang around this life. Okay? Now, I want you to go with me to the book of 1 Peter. And we're going to look at what Peter has to say from a New Testament perspective about how we face furnaces. We've already seen from an Old Testament perspective how people responded to these threats and these circumstances which try our faith. The three Hebrew children, these were men who could not worship other gods. The first commandment said, you shall have no other gods before you. And uh, so they knew they were not going to be able to do this, and neither were any of the other Jews. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were singled out to be put to death as a, an example to the other Jews that they were going to bow down to this image Nebuchadnezzar had made. I want to say to you tonight that, Nebu, that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego teaches us a very important lesson. It's an Old Testament lesson, but it is very appropriate for us tonight. And I, the, the message that I believe they teach us is this, that trust will take you where faith leaves off. Now here's what they said when Nebuchadnezzar said to them, you will bow down and worship this image or we will throw you into a furnace. And they answered Nebuchadnezzar and said, we're not careful about this. We're not careful about our answer. Our answer is this, we will not do that because we believe our God will deliver us. That's faith. But then they went on and said, but if not, we still will not bow down and worship. That's trust. You know, everybody wants to see Jesus and have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, but nobody wants to go through the fire. But these three kids, young people, they determined that they were going to go through the fire if necessary and die rather than bow down to this ungodly image Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And as a result, you know they were thrown into the furnace. And when they were in there, the only thing that was consumed or burned were their bounds, their, their, the, the ropes and things that had bound them. The Bible says they came out of that fire refurnished because there was a fourth man in there with them, and they didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. 
Now, I'm telling you, that's a tremendous lesson that every child of God needs to understand and needs to learn. And that is when your faith fails, just stand fast and trust God anyway. You may be thrown into the furnace, but you see, you don't see Jesus until you get into these kinds of situations. You don't see him quite so plainly, and you don't relate with him quite so well uh, until you get into these difficult situations. And the first fact about furnaces is that every one of us have to face them as a part of our lives. And in the book of, of uh, 1 Peter, Peter tells us from a New Testament perspective how we can face these fiery trials. For instance, look at verse 12 of 1 Peter 4. Peter says, Beloved, now he, he uses the word beginning verse 12 to let us know who he's talking to. He's talking to believers, and he uses the term beloved, which tells me that everything that follows that word is a word to the church or to the people of God. And listen to what he says. He said, Beloved, do not be surprised concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Peter is saying to us from a New Testament perspective, listen, trials and furnaces are a fact of life. And he uses two words here that really we need to latch on to because many of us are absolutely astonished when we come into a situation which tries our faith. Peter uses first the word surprised. He said, do not be surprised when you come into a fiery trial. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not surprised when they got thrown in that furnace. They knew that was going to happen. They had plenty of warning. They had plenty of opportunity to understand what was happening here. But so many times in life, you and I get ambushed by these things. I mean, they come right out of the blue. We aren't expecting anything. Our, our day has been great. Our week has been wonderful. Uh, our life has been wonderful. There's been no storm in our life for days or weeks or months. And out of the clear blue, from some unexpected source, here comes a storm sweeping through our lives, and it catches us by surprise. And Peter says, don't let that happen to you. Understand that the first fact of life is that there will be fiery furnaces. And then he says, secondly, uh, do not think it strange as though something strange were happening to you. When these things occur, we, they do surprise us. And when they occur, they, we do think them strange. We ask the question, why, Lord, am I going through this situation? Have you ever asked God that? I have. Uh, you know, I, I've gone through situations and, and I didn't understand what was going on. And I've said to God, God, am I doing something wrong? I mean, after all, I'm serving you with all my heart. I'm going after you with all my heart. I'm a godly man. I'm paying my tithes. I'm true to my wife. You know, I have a devotional life. I have a prayer life. And, and God, why is this happening to me? I've asked that to probably a thousand times in the 45 years I've been a believer. But Peter is cautioning us and saying to us, don't think it's strange and don't be surprised that these things come out of the blue and ambush you. It's part of life. It should neither surprise us nor seem strange to us that furnaces exist and sometimes we end up in them even though we are children of God. These are facts of life. And I want to say to you that these furnaces, these trials, these troubles, they, they issue from three sources. Three sources these things issue from. First of all, I believe many of the trials that we go through, many of the furnaces we find ourselves in, is directly attributable to us. We made our own problem. You see, I happen to believe this, that our decisions create our circumstances. Our decisions create our circumstances. Let me give you a scenario. 
that will illustrate this perhaps. A person is driving down the street, minding their own business, driving a perfectly good vehicle. And in the parking lot of some car lot, they, they come across or they see out of the corner of their eye a vehicle that catches their attention and they, they turn and look at that thing. And it is so appealing to them until they, they, they actually slow down. The next day they're driving by that same place and they decide that they're going to go in and take a look. And so they go in and take a look. And, um, you know, my, both my boys are in the car business, so I know how this works. I've asked them about uh, people who buy cars, and you know what they tell me? That 95% of the people that buy cars buy them out of emotion. And this, so these car dealers and these car salesmen, and if you're here tonight and you're a car salesman, don't get offended. I just told you I have two sons that are in the business, okay? And uh, so I know about this. So they know that people buy out of impulse. And so what they do is they structure their sales pitch to create that impulse or help that impulse in the individual. They'll say to the person that stops and looks at this car, man, this thing looks just exactly like you. I mean, you know, you would look, this is what you need to, you, I can tell that you're the kind of person that ought to be driving a car that looks like this. And, and, and there's that little little uh, uh, demon in there that wants to light a furnace in your life. And he's saying, yeah, man, this is just, this fits you like a glove. And uh, pretty soon before you know it, you'll, you'll, you'll leave. And before you know it, you're back there. And then you're on a test drive. And the next thing you know, you have this thing in your possession. And you now own a used car. You say, the thing's new. No, the minute it was titled... To you the minute you signed on the dotted line before you ever put a mile on that thing it was used you see when a car is titled it's used if you'll go out back and look at the at the Taurus that I drive that Taurus was bought on a Friday from one of my sons woman wanted a Windstar van but she didn't want to pay the Windstar price she wanted uh, something within a certain price range and as a result, she settled for that Taurus out there. She bought it on Friday. Monday, she came in because she saw herself in a Windstar, and that's what she wanted. And so Monday, she came in and traded that Taurus for a Windstar. That Taurus was a 98 car with 298 miles on it. And I got it at used car prices. See, it was used. And the reason was that she had to have a wind star. And many of us are caught with these impulses. And, you know, we drive off the showroom floor or off the lot of some car dealer with this car we want. And we're going to drive it for 40 days because the payment's not due until 40 days down the road. And when the payment comes due, suddenly we realize that this thing won't fit in our budget. And we come up to the end of the month and we've got more month left than we've got money. You ever been there? And we're in a furnace. And the reason we're in that furnace is because of a decision we made. We bought something on impulse. Something we had no need for whatsoever. The car we were driving was in perfect mechanical condition. It was as it would get us where we needed to go. But oh, we just had to have this new car. And we got the new car. And suddenly now we are in debt. And we have a debt we cannot pay. So what you need to do when you do something like that, you need to buy an ad in the paper with a telephone number and ask and tell them when they call this number, ask for dummy. And here's what I've noticed about us when we do things like that. When we make those kinds of decisions that put us into a furnace type situation, we become as irritable as an old hen sitting on eggs. Now, you probably were not raised on a farm, but I was. And I'm telling you, when a hen decides to sit on eggs to hatch them, you don't want to mess with her. She will hurt you. 
And, and people that make these kind of rash, the impulsive decisions that put themselves in furnace-type circumstances, they are as irritable as that hen protecting her eggs. They're mad at themselves, actually angry with themselves, but they'll take it out on you. And so uh, these, these furnaces sometimes issue from, from, from ourselves. Other times, there's a second source uh, of furnaces, and that is from Satan. I believe Satan is always preparing and lighting furnaces and turning the heat up real hot. You see, a war started in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, between God and Satan with the fall of man. And Satan's only means and Satan's only weapons to hurt God is by hurting God's people. Since God's people live in this alien environment where Satan is the God of this world, then furnaces are going to be present just like they were present in Babylon. You see, the three Hebrew children lived in an alien environment. The Babylonian culture was not their culture. The Babylonian gods were not their god. And as a result, they lived in this alien uh, culture, in this alien environment, and because they were aliens in that, there were furnaces that, as a result of it. And I want you to know tonight, friends, you and I live in an alien environment as children of God. Get used to it. People in this world don't like us. They have other gods. They don't serve the God we serve. And when we refuse to bow to their God, then Satan attacks. No wonder Peter said, don't be surprised or think it's strange. Jesus warned the disciples and warned us in John chapter 16, verse 33 about this very matter. If you read John 14, 15, 16, and 17, you will hear the last words of a dying man. And I want you to know the last words of a dying man are important words. And those are some of the last words of Jesus in, in, in those four chapters there. And it is in one of these chapters, chapter 16 and verse 33, that Jesus uttered these words, and I quote, In the world you shall have tribulation. In the world you shall have tribulation. I'm talking about furnaces are a fact of life. Not only did, did Peter tell us that, but Jesus told us that. But it surprises the daylights out of us, and we think it's strange and wonder why we're going through what we're going through. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You may be in a furnace, friends, like the, the three Hebrew children, but don't sweat it. Stay there in the heat and Jesus will come and rescue you. Hallelujah. He said it himself. He said it himself. And he's not a man that he can lie. He said, you're going to have the tribulation, but be of good cheer. Don't be surprised and don't think it's strange, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So their source of these furnaces, first of all, may be ourselves, or secondly, the source of the furnace may be Satan, or thirdly, the source of the furnace that we find ourselves in may be produced by people. And there are two classes of people in our lives that create problems for us. And I'm not thinking about live people and dead people. <laughs> Those are not the two classes I'm thinking about. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the people that are without and the people that are within. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the people outside of the kingdom of God. They will persecute you. They will create problems for you. There is a difference between believers and unbelievers. There is a difference between us. The modern church has not believed that. And by and large, we have confused personality with righteousness. We're out.
out there in the work world, we're out there in the school, we're out there in the neighborhood, and somebody has a good personality or they are nice to our faith and we are absolutely sucked into believing that they really like us because we're children of God. Can I tell you that people that serve the devil do not like the people of God? We're on different sides of the issue. We march to different drummers. They don't understand us any more than, than the light understands darkness. They don't understand us, and they don't like us. They may be nice to your face, but I'm telling you, they do not like us. You turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 for just a moment, and I want to share this scripture with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 14 through 18. Listen to what Paul says here. Is it uh, 2 Corinthians 6? 14 to 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Friend, I, I don't believe this is talking about a marriage being yoked together in marriage. I'm talking about relationships where, where the people of God get too intimate with unsaved people, and that's why people backslide. That's why people backslide. I'm gonna tell you, friend, you cannot go hang out in a bar as a believer. You cannot go hang out in a strip joint as a believer. You cannot do that. You don't have anything in common with those people. And this is what Paul's talking about here. Look at verse 15. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what port has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Now, what is it about that you do not understand? I mean, that's pretty clear, friend. You say, is Paul saying to us that we cannot have any unsaved friends? No, that's not what Paul is saying. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that you and I cannot get into a relationship that is so involved that that lifestyle begins to spill over into our lifestyle. We're in this culture not to go along with this culture, but we are in the world to change the world. God didn't call us to come into the kingdom of God and go along to get along. God called us into the kingdom of God to transform light, darkness into light. He said, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And God knows we need to rub shoulders with unbelievers. I believe that one of the reasons that Christians do not win people to the Lord is because they have no contact with unbelievers. They don't let unbelievers even into their life or into their thinking process. They work with them, but they, they maintain a too distant uh, relationship with them. Paul's not saying that you cannot talk to an unbeliever or you cannot be nice to an unbeliever. What Paul is saying here in cautioning is that we cannot cross over that line and get into their lifestyle in order, and think we're going to bring them to the kingdom of God. No, they come over to our lifestyle. That's what Paul's talking about here. And I think that if, uh, if, if we got out there among unbelievers, more often we'd see more unbelievers saved. Paul draws the distinction that unbelie the unbeliever life is based on lies and pl pride and pleasure and selfishness, while the believer's life is based on truth, humility, holiness, and a desire to glorify God. Consequently, because of those differences, 
the conflict between the lifestyles and the values of believers and unbelievers produces furnaces in our lives. Uh, somebody was telling me, it was uh, Bill, um, Bill Suddeth was just telling me, he just came back from out in Portland, Oregon, and he was telling me uh, that there was, was in, in the city of Portland, they had a, a homosexual pride demonstration out there. And, um, and do, you, do you know what the whole homosexual agenda is? Friend, it's not. It's not about them having freedom to do what they want to do. They have the freedom to do what they want to do. This whole agenda is not about that. This whole agenda is a pressure being applied to you and me to, uh, to, to give our stamp of approval of that lifestyle. And I'm going to tell you, never under the sun will I do that. It's contrary to the Word of God, and not only that, but adultery and thievery and lying and all the other things I will not give a, a stamp of approval to because it's contrary to the Word of God. But you see, the reason the church is called homophobic, it's not because we're fearful of homosexuals. I'm not afraid of a homosexual. I love the individuals who are, I hate their sin. Adulterers, you know, I'm not adulterophobic. Are you? I'm not afraid of adulterers. I love adulterers, but I hate their sin. And so does God. And you see, that's uh, uh, homophobic. I mean, that's a, that's a great term, isn't it? Why don't we say adulterophobic? Why don't we say liophobic? Why don't we say thiefophobic? You know? The church isn't phobic about any of those things. The church just stands against those things because God's Word stands against those things. And friend, that the line is drawn. And because the lifestyles are so different, there are going to be conflicts and there will be furnaces as a result of the conflicts. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say to you. So don't, don't be surprised or think it's strange when these things happen with people in the world. Probably the thing that really surprises us and re we really think is strange is when we get it from those within the kingdom. You know, we can sort of handle it from outside. But boy, it really surprises us and we think it's strange when it comes from those within. Pain is caused from those within the family that puts us in furnishes, furnaces. I wish I could assure you that no furnace experience could ever be caused by those within the household of faith. I wish I could assure you of that. But the brutal truth, the, the brutal truth is that Abel was not murdered by a stranger. The brutal truth is Abel was not murdered by a stranger. Abel was murdered by his brother. Jesus was betrayed by a disciple. Religious people create furnaces for righteous people. Let me say that again. Religious people create furnaces for righteous people. If you don't believe it, you get real serious about serving God and see what happens to you. We experienced it right here in this church when this revival began. Religion jumped right up in our face. Two of pastors more closest to friends in this church got in his face and were yelling at him and telling him, commanding him, he would stop this revival. And John Kilpatrick had to look at them and say, I will not stop this revival. And they said, we'll leave. And he said, there's the door. <laughs> and some of the most vicious critics of our pastor are those people that were within. Jesus warned in Matthew 10, 17 with these words, beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Do you notice where that's occurring? It's not occurring out there on the street and it isn't occurring in a jail. It's not occurring someplace in a pagan environment. It is occurring in the synagogues, Jesus said. 
Jesus said, you serve me and you'll be scourged in the very house of God. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've been a Christian 45 years and I've got sheep bites all over me. It's the honest to God truth. Some of the worst pain I've suffered since I've been a Christian in the ministry has been inflicted upon me by those in the household of faith. Those many times that I was trying to pastor. You know, if you'd have talked to some of them, you would have thought I came to town to ruin their lives. I mean, does this make sense? A guy leaves everything and goes to a city to pastor people. He's away from family. He's away from loved ones. He's, he's living on a sub, uh, sub salary. And, and people persecute the guy because he's simply there trying to help them and trying to, to lead them and trying to pastor them, and he's persecuted for that. It's happening every day, even as we live. In fact, I would venture to say since this is Wednesday night, and Wednesday night services are going on all across this nation, that there are pastors that are preaching to people, and those people are sitting in pews looking into the face of a man of God that loves them, has left everything to come there to pastor them, and they're looking in his face with defiance and hatred as if he's come there to ruin their lives. I know because I talk to pastors all the time. Peter calls these things fiery trials in the King James. He sees them as a refining process, a refining process, not the judgment of God. You see, many of us, when we get caught in these fiery trials, we think that it's the judgment of God that's come upon us. But Peter says, no, it's the refining process of God that has just been, you've just been introduced to. <laughs> he uses the word happen. Do not str think strange or, or do not be surprised concerning these fiery trials which is to come upon you as though some strange thing happened. He uses the word happen. These things are not accidents. These furnaces that come our way. Do you think that furnace in that Nebuchadnezzar prepared for those three Hebrew children surprised God? Do you think God had a, an emergency plan, a planning meeting as to how he was going to respond to Nebuchadnezzar's demand? Do you think all of heaven was brought to a standstill and anxiety level began to rise in the kingdom of, of heaven? And God said, wait a minute, boys, we've been, we've been blindsided here. We've got to figure something out. No, that wasn't it at all. God knew what was happening down there. And God had already made a way of escape. Didn't he say that he would not allow you to be tempted? Beyond, beyond that, you were able to bear, but with every temptation would make a way of escape for you. Did not he say that? He said that. And so I'm telling you tonight that if you're in a furnace, or when you do get in a furnace, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. Furnaces are a fact of life. Everybody faces them. The three Hebrew children were doing what was, what was right, yet they still found themselves in a furnace. God was personally with them, however. And I have to say this to you. God is closest to you when your pain is the greatest. Did you hear me? God is the closest to you and the closest to me when our pain is the greatest. And he will sustain us in the furnace and through the furnace. Many times he will not keep us from the furnace, but he will sustain us in and through the furnace. But you know what, what we want? The minute this thing begins to heat up, we want deliverance. Oh God! God says, no, I'm going to leave you there and I'm going to develop you. I'm not going to deliver you. I'm going to develop you. I'm going to tell you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were never the same after they went through that furnace. How many of you believe that you can go through a situation like that and be the same? Do you really believe you can go through a situation like that and be the same person? I'm telling you, you can't. 
and you can't go through a trial or a difficulty in your life and see God working miraculous wonders in your behalf, you cannot go through that and come out the other end and be the same person. You are changed as a result of that. And that's what God's trying to do, folks. God's trying to put us in situations and circumstances to change our lives. God's got a plan for us. He wants to make something out of us. God wants to do something through us. But in order for that to happen, many times he will allow us to go through these circumstances or situations in order to develop that within us that needs to be developed. You believe that? That's the honest to God truth. That's the honest to God truth. I personally believe that all of my life, and everything I've experienced and everything I've gone through, up until five years ago, I went through those things and God allowed those things in my life in preparation for this, for this. I guarantee you, I would not be the assistant pastor of this church had I not gone through those things in my life and I hated every minute of it. I hated every minute of it. See, I'm not masochistic, and I'm not saying you have got to enjoy this. I'm just saying that God can get great glory out of this stuff when we go through it. Think about the impression with that, that was made upon Nebuchadnezzar when those three Hebrew kids came out of there. Their, 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 their bonds were gone. There wasn't the smell of smoke upon them. Brother, I'm telling you, God had an idea to impress a king's mind as to who was God. Nebuchadnezzar didn't get it at that time. God had to take him through some other things, but he finally got it. And God may be trying to teach some Nebuchadnezzar in your life a lesson. <laughs> and that's why he lets him throw you into a furnace. And so be patient. I'm not going to finish this message. I've got three other points. Y'all come back next Wednesday or whenever I preach again, and I'll finish it. Otherwise, always wonder. But I have an idea. I have an idea that there are people in this room that can identify with what I was just talking about. In fact, I, I know deep in my spirit that there are people in this room right now. When I was talking about this, your heart began to pound and palpitate and you suddenly realize that God sent you here to put his finger on that point in your life. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you heard God's word for you. Not because I preached it, but because of where you are and what you're going through. And you may be here tonight and you may not even know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you wonder, well, why did I even come? I'm going to tell you why you came. You came because God had a design and a plan for you. You're not here by accident. You say, my life is in a mess. Yeah, it's in a mess. Probably in a mess because of you or because of Satan or because you let someone lead you down a primrose path. They promised you pleasure, enjoyment, love, happiness, whatever they promised you. And instead of getting that, your life is in shambles right now. Well, I have good news for you, friend. Jesus can bring you out of that furnace. He can bring you out of that furnace. You say, but you don't know how tainted with sin my life is right now. I'm telling you that the God who brought three Hebrew children out of a fiery, smoky furnace without even the smell of smoke upon their body can bring you out of your situation without one single stain of sin being left upon your life. I'm telling you that right now. And you listen to this preacher. Don't you believe a lie from the pit of hell? You've already believed a lie, and that's why you're a sinner. Don't you believe any more lies of the pit of hell? You believe the Word of God. God's a loving Savior, and God didn't, lo didn't love those three Hebrew children any more than He loves you. He got them out of that mess, and He'll get you out of your mess. You understand? He will. 
And I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond in a minute. There are others of you that you're in the mess you're in because you've made some bad choices. You've made some bad choices. And maybe even tonight you're here because of those bad choices. And, and, and you're lukewarm. And you came to Brownsville thinking, well, the fire of God's down there, and maybe if I go down there, something will change. I'm glad to tell you something will change. But you have to make a good decision in order for things to change for you. And so I'm going to give an invitation. And when I give the invitation, you're going to come to this altar, and you're going to confess that stuff and get it out of your life. You're going to repent of it. See, confession says I'm guilty. I did it. And that's necessary according to Romans 10, 9, and 10. With the mouth, confession is made. But friend, there is a step beyond confession, and that step is repentance. Repentance means this. I not only confess I did it, and I'm not only sorry that I did it, but I am making a commitment never to do it again. That's repentance. That's repentance. And friend, when you make that kind of a commitment... I'm telling you, all the resources of heaven suddenly kick in on your behalf. And no matter what furnace or trial you face, if you will stay, stay true to God, God will bring you through that thing just like he did these three Hebrew children. I promise you that. I promise you that. I'm not patting myself on the back, but I've lived for God 45 years. I've failed a lot of times, but I'm telling you, I always ran back to God. I didn't run from God, I ran to God. And that's why I'm still here 45 years later. Had I run from God, I'm telling you, I would have lost it all. But I, I understood and I understand that God is a loving God and a loving Father. And if I will come to Him, He will not cast me aside. And neither will He you. And there are others of you in this room, you've been bruised and sorely wounded. Not only by those without, but by some within. And that wound is, is a festering thing in you, and you're having a difficulty forgiving because of what they did to you. Let me tell you something, friends. If you want a book that will absolutely open your eyes to offense and unforgiveness, get John Bevere's book, The Bait of Satan. You see, hell puts people in our lives to offend us so that we will swallow the bait of offense and become bitter and disillusioned and unforgiving toward a person and thereby lose out with God. I'm going to tell you, your unforgiveness of an individual is not hurting that individual one bit. It's destroying you. And you need to come and, and, and confess that thing and repent of it tonight. So this message is applicable to all of us tonight. If we're not going through a furnace, we're going to go through one. You say, I don't have any unforgiveness in my life tonight. You'll have an opportunity in the near future to hold someone in unforgiveness because I'm going to tell you, right around the next corner, somebody's going to offend you. And you have a choice to make. And I hope you'll remember this message tonight. Now, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. We're not making an emotional appeal. We're making an appeal based on the Word of God and based on reason. If for any reason this message has touched your heart in any place and you need to pray, I want you to come to this altar when I count three. One, two, three. Come. Come. Step out and come right now. Step out and come right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just get down on your knees right here. We're going to just take care of this thing right here tonight. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just look at this. Look at this. I knew, I knew this was the message for tonight. I knew it in my spirit. Knew it in my spirit. There are many others of you that you're standing there and you need to be down here. You know you do. And I'm asking you to just shrug it off and come on down. Come on. Come on. I'm going to wait about 30 seconds and then I'm going to close this altar call. I shouldn't have to beg anybody about this situation. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just come on. Join these. And we're going to have a prayer together. Hallelujah. 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 
about 15 seconds and we're going to close the altar call. Praise God. Bless the Lord. Jesus, Lord. Jesus, Lord. Jesus, Lord. Ten seconds. Ten seconds and we're going to close. Five seconds and we're going to close. If you're coming, step out now. This altar service is closed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody at the altar, I want you to look up here just a moment at me. Just stop praying and look up here. I want to tell you, God is so pleased with you. God is so pleased with you. I don't know what brought you down here, but I want to assure you that God is pleased with you right now. If you could see his face, he would have a smile on his face as big as Texas. God is just so pleased with you right now. I can't tell. I don't have a, I don't have a vocabulary that can explain to you how pleased God is with you right now. And God's going to build something into you as a result of you coming. You see, the fact that, you, that you're going you're to pray in a minute, uh, that's sort of a little byproduct. The minute you stepped out, that's what counted. Because, you see, there's where the decision was made right there. It's not what you say in a minute as we, we go into this prayer that that's going to turn the tide. It was a decision that you made when you stepped out. I always, when people step out in the altar service, my mind goes back to the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. You remember that boy came home, a Jewish boy, with a smell of pigs on him? I'm going to tell you, when a Jewish boy has pig stench on him, he's gone too far. And here he is, he's coming home. And before he gets home, his dad sees him a long way off, and his dad does not wait for the boy to get home. His dad breaks into a run, and run, he's an old man, but he runs to meet that boy. It's the sprint of God's love. And I'm going to tell you, when you stepped out of your pew, God started running toward you in the spirit, and God put his arm around you. You may say, well, I'm stained, and I, you know, I, my life is stained. I'm telling you, God's put his arm around you just like that father put his arms around that boy that smelled of a pig pen. He loves you. He loves you. And the decision's already been made. Now we're just going to seal it with a prayer. And I want you to pray out loud. Those of you that are standing in the congregation, I want you to join these. And I want you to pray out loud with them. All of us praying the same prayer right now. Everybody ready? Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for bringing me to this altar. I'm here, Lord, because of a furnace. I'm here because I need to get out of this thing. Or I need to be delivered through this thing. Whichever way you choose, Father, will be okay with me. I'm just down here to tell you that I've made up my mind that I'm going to follow you and I'm going to go with you and I'm going to serve you no matter what. I'm leaving my sins behind. I'm leaving my unforgiveness behind. I'm leaving my attitudes behind. I'm here tonight, Lord, to make a declaration to heaven and to hell. Hell, my declaration to you is this. It's over and done with with you. I'm finished with you. Heaven, my declaration to you is that I'm coming. I'm coming home. And Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, and make me your child. And go ahead and do with me what you want to do. I believe you love me and have a plan for my life. And your love is so great that you would never harm me in any way or allow me to be harmed. Father, I know you are not a child abuser and you will not abuse me as your child. And so I'm here to put myself squarely in the face of your mercy. And I ask you to help me in Jesus name, amen. Hallelujah, give God glory. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord.